London is one of the world's great cities. From the glamour of a West End theatre to the high finance of the city or the history and power of Parliament, it's got everything. And while I moved away recently, for most of my adult life, it's also been my home and where I've worked. I'm David Ingle, founder and ministry director of Burning Hearts, and I love London, and I've benefited and enjoyed being part of it. But I think I've also picked up some of its weaknesses, particularly around the stress, busyness and intensity of London life. Something which I think is also a weakness of our generation more generally. I realised that for me one day as I was leading a service in my old church. As I finished, I prayed a prayer over everyone there that I used to pray at the end of most services. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds. I realised as I prayed that that peace I was praying over everyone else wasn't something that I was experiencing in my own life. And I wanted that to change. Sadly, my issues and struggles in not experiencing God's peace are all too common. Each of our stories is unique in the details, but lack of peace seems to be common to many of them. Whether it's the student struggling to cope with the pressures of social media, parents overwhelmed by family life, someone weighed down with health problems or the stresses of a high intensity job, our world is full of unpeace. And if that's you, then can I invite you to join me to explore together how that can change. We're going to go back to that prayer for peace that I prayed over my congregation. And like many of the best prayers, it comes from the Bible. And a promise in Philippians. And the peace of God which transcends or passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Exploring those words and the things Paul says around them has been transformative for me. My understanding and experience of peace has really changed. So in this series, we're going to take a deep dive into Philippians 4, 4 to 9 and what it shows us about peace. The first thing that strikes me, though, is a problem. Paul promises us peace. He tells us that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Not might or could or sometimes, but will. So why don't we always feel at peace? An asking and answering back question has really been what set me going. I think I'd always assumed that peace was something that just happens to you, or in my case, doesn't happen to you. I, I thought that God would give me his peace regardless of what I did, and yet he hadn't. So I went back to the promise and asked, why not? Is there something here that I've missed? And I realised that there was. The first word of the promise, a word we usually miss or skip over, and, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I'd always read the promise on its own as a sort of standalone gift, but suddenly I realised that it isn't. The promise flows out of what Paul has just been saying. If we do that, then peace will follow. Peace isn't something that just happens. It's something we can go after, something we need to go after, which is why I've not called this series Experiencing Peace, but Pursuing Peace. It's proactive. And so we ask, what comes before the and? And the answer is a series of instructions and commands. Now, our generation can often bristle at commands and being told, do this or do that. But God's instructions to us are never given to restrict or burden us, but to help us. And that's particularly clear in these verses. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. 
and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's a whole bunch of things that Paul is telling us to do in these verses. Rejoice, be gentle, don't be anxious, give thanks, pray. They're like a recipe for peace, in which all of the commands come together in this promise of peace. It is like following a recipe. You can obviously choose to ignore the instructions if you want, but you won't get the results at the end if you do. And Paul is telling us that each of these instructions is a key ingredient in the recipe for God's peace. In the rest of the series, we're going to explore each ingredient in turn, digging into what all these instructions mean and how they can help us experience God's peace. Our list isn't exhaustive though, and there are lots of other helpful resources for pursuing peace which we find elsewhere in the Bible, including in the very next verse, which we will also look at, and which ends with the promise that if we follow its advice, the God of peace will be with you. For now though, I want to ask what this all means for us, and look more closely at the promise that the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Starting by saying how much difference this has made in my life. In recent years, I really have experienced God's peace in a fresh and deeper way. Even though they've been busy and tumultuous years, I've moved job, become a dad for the first time, and like all of us, walked through pandemic and lockdown. It's not been simple. And yet I have known God's peace. I have a way to go still, but this is now my experience and testimony in a way it wasn't before. And I think it's significant that my experience of peace has come in the midst of busyness or even adversity. Because when we think of peace, we tend to think of ways in which we can escape from the stresses and strains of ordinary life, where we can just unwind and forget about the busyness and pressures of our daily life. Or we use guides and techniques to try and clear our minds and switch off for some downtime. And there is something in that. Scripture talks a lot about Sabbath and experiencing God's rest, but not as a way of escaping the troubles of life, but as part of the rhythms and patterns for what it looks like to flourish more widely. And here, Paul doesn't promise that the peace of God will keep us from the pressures and struggles of life but that it will sustain us in the midst of them. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The Tower of London is one of the most famous castles in the world. These days, it's a big tourist attraction, full of family fun and entertainment, but its original purpose was very different. It was built by William the Conqueror over 900 years ago, and he was a foreign king, worried and uncertain about London's loyalty to him. And the tower was built as a fortress to guard and protect him in the midst of a potentially hostile city and population. And I think that's a beautiful illustration of what Paul is talking about here. The peace of God is like a fortress that guards and protects our hearts and minds not just when we're on holiday or life's easy, but also when it's tough and we're in the midst of the stress and struggles of life. That was certainly Paul's own experience. Just a few verses later, he tells us, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. That's a pretty big thing to say at the best of times. But for Paul, this wasn't the best of times. As well as a famous castle, the tower was historically one of England's most feared and notorious jails and places of execution. And when I look at its walls and gates with that in mind and think about all those imprisoned inside over the years, it's a sobering and unsettling thought also one that helps me grasp Paul's situation when he wrote this letter, because we know he was in prison at the time. In chapter 1, he describes himself as in chains for Christ. 
And many scholars think that this was probably his final imprisonment before his trial and execution. I don't know about you, but I think I'd find that pretty stressful. And yet Paul, in the midst of it, can describe himself as content and talk of peace. How? Well, the key to understanding that is to look at where Paul's peace comes from. And peace and well-being are hot topics in our world today, with thousands of competing answers filling our social media feeds and conversations. But one thing that all of them seem to have in common is the assumption that if we want to find peace, we need to look within ourselves. But Paul's solution is very different. He looks not to himself, but to God. And what we're promised here is not some vague or general sense of peace, but the peace of God, which guards our hearts and minds, not because of what we can do or the resources we can find in ourselves, but in Christ Jesus. And there's a fragility to the peace the world can give. It rests on our health or prosperity or situation in life. And as those shift or crack, it can quickly give way. But what we have in God is secure and unshakable, a rock that holds firm no matter what life may throw at us. Because however strong and successful we may be, there's always a limit to our strength and resources, but not God's. His strength and power will never run out and his compassions and love never fail. And so God's peace holds firm even when all else crumbles. Even as Paul writes from prison and knows that death may be close, he can know this peace because what he has in Christ Jesus is stronger even than death itself. I think that's what he means when he says that the peace of God transcends all understanding. It's beyond our capacity to grasp and beyond what we could ever expect or hope for. Which brings us to the question of what does that look like? What does it mean to experience the peace of God which transcends all understanding? Is it a feeling or an emotion, something in our internal world? Well, yes. Paul does talk about it guarding our hearts and minds, and so we should expect it to have an impact on our thoughts and feelings. But it is also more than that. Paul would have been thinking about all the Old Testament has to say about peace when he wrote this. And the Hebrew word shalom is much bigger and richer than the English peace. It comes from a word for completeness or wholeness, and its focus is not primarily on how we feel, but how we are, whether our life is whole and as it should be, and particularly whether that's true in our relationships with others and with God. There's something objective about God's peace. Shalom means being right with God and whole and secure because of that. And that's not something we can earn but something we're given, as Paul puts it here, in Christ Jesus. And that's what makes the peace of God so utterly secure. And it also has big implications for what it means to experience God's peace. Because it means that it's not just about our emotions and thoughts and feelings. It's not the same as being calm and laid back, what the world thinks of when it talks about peace. We can experience God's peace, shalom, even when our minds and hearts are all over the place. And this is maybe particularly important for those who are struggling in this area to hear, such as with depression or a serious and enduring mental health condition or, or grief or simply lack of sleep. Paul's point here is not that you've got it wrong, but that Jesus has already got it right for you and that he's with you even in the midst of the storm and struggles that you're facing. Now, I do believe that that will have an impact on how you think and how you feel, that the peace of God can still guard your heart and your mind, even in the midst of emotional turmoil. But that comfort and assurance may not always feel the same as being happy or relaxed. Because I think many people out there believe that you have to sort of be peaceful 
before you can really encounter God. And one of the challenges facing many people exploring the Christian faith is that either they don't feel good enough for the Christian faith, or they don't feel sorted out enough, particularly in their mental and emotional health. The experience of some Christians in the church has been to feel stigmatized spiritually because of their mental health problem. And actually, the inverse is true in that many of the founders of our faith have been people who've struggled with their mental health. They've experienced God's peace despite their mental health uh, distress. Take uh, Martin Luther, who's the father of the Reformation. He suffered from acute anxiety and some obsessive compulsive disorder. He famously threw his paint pot at the devil. Florence Nightingale, who had bipolar disorder, or, or William Cooper, who had uh, acute depression, or Charles Spurgeon, who spent 20 years depressed, or Mother Teresa, who was depressed for most of her ministry of compassion. All these people had a unique relationship with the peace of God, despite quite acute emotional distress. That actually, the Christian gospel transcends our experience of mental health. God is present with us in that moment and can bring peace despite our circumstances. I suffered from an acute uh, anxiety breakdown in 2005. And I say my mind was incredibly disordered and I was acutely distressed. And yet the one thing I could hold on to was that the peace of God was mine despite my mental health experience. And so one of the one of the most amazing realities for Christians is that my peace is not dependent upon the settlement of my uh, human mind, that my peace is something existential, something beyond myself, that God can give me that peace in all circumstances. And for me, holding on to the peace of God, despite my emotional turbulence, despite my acute distress, was something that really kept me going. Our experience of the peace of God might not always feel like holidays and happiness, but that doesn't mean it can't be real. The Bible often uses the image of a flourishing tree as a picture of life with God. And this tree, lush and strong in the midst of the tarmac and concrete of city life, makes me think of Paul's description of himself as content or at peace, whatever the circumstances. How can we blossom and flourish and know God's peace even when life seems to push against it? Well, a couple of verses later, Paul tells us his secret. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. On one level, Paul's words are very active. I can do all this. But they're not self-reliant because he knows he can only do them through him who gives me strength, through Jesus. And for the rest of this series, we're going to explore what we can do to pursue God's peace. And we'll look at the recipe and ingredients that Paul gives us here. But one of the things that we'll discover is that all of them are rooted in our life with Jesus. None of them makes any sense at all unless we do them through him who gives us strength. And so as we finish this first episode, I want to pray that God would do just that, strengthen you and give you peace. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your promises of peace, of shalom. I pray that you would help and strengthen each of us as we work through the rest of this passage, that everyone watching might indeed know the peace of God, which passes all understanding, and that it might guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. Have you ever considered doing one of our series with your small group? If you do, we have discussion guides, downloadable versions and other resources all free on our website, burningheart.org. I would also love to ask you to help us keep our films free for everyone. Could you pay it forward and help us make our next series, either by praying or giving? Thanks so much.